Thanks be to God. Over the last weeks, we've been looking at Leviticus. Last week, we spent a day with uh, Isaiah, last Sunday, with Suffering Servant, Isaiah 52 and 53. And we've been putting together an understanding of sacrifice in the Jewish worldview. We've been building to this question we come to every time, every, uh, at this time of year, every year. We come as we approach the cross. We ask, how does Jesus save? What does it mean to say Jesus saves? We're, we look at the cross and talk about salvation. And so by, by spending this time, I think we've been prepared to, to answer this question with maybe a little bit more depth, a little bit more nuance. But before I attempt to answer that question or take a swing at answering this, how does Jesus save, I need to ask a different question to help us understand what we're doing here. A very important question. What's the right piece of pie to order after lunch? What's the right piece of pie? Is it cherry? Is it apple? Meringue? <coughs> lemon? Chocolate? What's the right piece of pie? Okay. Right? A lot of different options. It doesn't really make sense to ask what the right piece is, is it? Right? You can ask for a good piece, well prepared, right? Good crust, well, good, good filling, well put together. But uh, it doesn't make sense to ask what the right piece is. In, in the same way, I'm going to serve you a slice of pie today. It's the slice of pie I have to offer you, and I hope the slice of pie I have to offer you is tasty. And by tasty, I hope what it, by by that I mean it is uh, theologically coherent and biblically sound. But I, I do want to acknowledge up front that different church traditions, different denominations, different pastors are going to answer this question, how does Jesus save, in different ways, and they're all tasty slices of pie. I am certain that the mystery of salvation, what happens on the cross, is far beyond the ability of one pastor to fully explore in one sermon. I'm going to take a swing at it, but uh, this is just my slice. right? So, here we go. I'm going to do this in three moves. We're going to briefly review Leviticus, we're going to brief, briefly review Isaiah, then we're going to land at the foot of the cross and see what we make of it. Reading Leviticus, as you might remember, is like reading Shakespeare. You're reading a script. It is meant to be embodied, uh, lived, acted. And what uh, is lived and acted, what is laid out by God, is a way for the people to live uh, that is again and again described as clean, but is better translated as normal, establishing what is normal for God's people, what we, what we might think of as being uh, peace, or the Hebrew word shalom. And so uh, in the Levitical system, the sacrifices are used to restore deviations from clean, from normal, to restore people to, to the peace, the norm, the way that uh, God desires people to live. And the great temptation, as we looked at, of, of this system is to get mechanical about it, to get Get algebraic about it to try to uh, like figure out how many pounds of goat do I need to sacrifice for that much sin, right? If I talk back to my parents, is that like a seven pound of goat sin? If I don't do what I said I was going to do, if I was lie, is that like a twenty pound of goat sin, right? I do. If you have to solve for x, x much sin equals y many pounds of goat and, and z many liters of goat's blood on the altar. I mean that that sort of attempt to figure out uh, mechanically doesn't work, right? It's a relational way of restoring relationship. As we looked at, it's like if I, am, if I get sideways with Olivia, which does happen, uh, I go and I get her flowers, right? And it's not like she has to forgive me if I give her six roses because I have now gotten her sufficient roses and this much and idiocy equals this many roses. There's not a relationship like that. It's a, it's a, there's not a ratio. It's, it's a relationship. The Jewish person sins, goes and offers a goat, and God responds. And so Leviticus is a way that, that God trains God's people to be able to buy God flowers, so to speak. Now Leviticus, having formed a people to understand sacrifice as a relational, as the way to restore themselves to clean, to normal, to be at peace with God and neighbor, we then see how this is lived out in the, the servant that the prophet Isaiah describes. The prophet Isaiah uh, brings up the Jewish, brings the Jewish people this news from God about how God works not just through the sacrifice of goats, but through the sacrifice that the suffering servant makes. Having first been exalted, this servant is then humbled and marred and is rejected, but by the arm of God, by God's power, 
this uh, servant is then uh, rebuilds what is broken, and by his bruises there is healing. By his sacrifice there is redemption. And the original understanding of the suffering servant was that it was Israel. Obviously it's Israel. Israel is uh, chosen as God's people, goes into exile due to their sin, and after their sufferings they are healed and made whole by God's power and they are restored. In the New Testament we left off last week by looking at the way that um, the early disciples looked at the suffering servant and then looked at Jesus and said, Aha! It's the same thing. God is at it again. It's this idea of recapitulation. Jesus lives the story of Israel, and, and where Israel had failed, Jesus gets it right. And so if you lay the story of Jesus and the story of Israel side by side, you see, see things like uh, Israel goes into the wilderness for 40 years before it gets to the promised land. Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days before he uh, begins his ministry. And so Jesus is recapitulating what Israel did, and, and it, it, the suffering servant story, the way that God works through suffering, through that sacrifice, becomes the way that, that early Christians understand how to describe who Jesus is. Well, when Philip, uh, one of the early disciples, meets this Ethiopian fellow who's reading Isaiah, he t says, this is how to understand it, right? And, and so a quick review of where we've been, just to make sure we're all with us. We, we've talked about Leviticus and the sacrificial system, how it's relational. We've looked at Isaiah and the way that that is, um, it is the sacrifice of this servant that is, is healing. Right, everyone on board with that? Any questions? Okay. Now we're going to, now we got to land at uh, Holy Week, Good Friday and Easter. How does this work to save us? How, what, is it, what do we mean when we say Jesus saves? Well, first we see that Jesus died a dishonorable death. A disgraceful death, a death that is so bad that one of the explicit privileges of being a Roman citizen is that you cannot be crucified. Right? That's an explicit privilege. You will never die by crucifixion. And you might ask, well, who crucified him? Right? That, that becomes pertinent. The, who crucified Jesus is that uh, it's the very worst of humanity that crucified Jesus. Jesus was crucified by the misguided action of a single person, Judas who sought to manipulate him and to force him to begin an insurrection, a rebellion against Rome. And so Jesus was crucified by an individual. Jesus was crucified by the desertion of his friends in a craven act. Those who had committed their very lives to following him, when it mattered, when the cock crowed, they were nowhere to be found. And so Jesus was not only crucified by an individual, he was crucified by the cowardice of his friends. And finally, Jesus was crucified by the idiocy of the mob that sought its own entertainment and safety above all else, and in its rush could not see, and in its rush could not see what it was doing. And so Jesus was crucified by an individual, by an individual's sin, by the sin of those, those he trusted most. He was crucified by the idiocy of the mob. And we must all confess that we've all been part of these moments, right? We have all done some really stupid things individually. We have all done some rather sinful things in, in groups, and we've all been part of larger groups that have uh, done some very stupid things as well. It is this capacity, this bent to sinning by humanity that nailed Jesus to the cross. It was humanity that crucified Jesus. Now, you might wonder, was it like, we talk about my sin crucified Jesus. Again, the temptation is to make this algebraic and to make it mechanical. Like, if I look at my last week, how much of my sin crucified Jesus to the cross? Can we, like, break it down mathematically? Can we figure out, like, the percentage? Like, how much of a nail do I get to claim? When, I cru when Jesus was crucified, do I claim, like, 3% of the nail that went into his left arm, right? You can try to think about it like that. But, uh, again, that misses the point that Leviticus teaches us, right? Everyone is fully human, and this is a relational thing that's happening. We, humanity rejected Jesus, and, and as part of humanity, we would have done the same if we were there then, and, and we have rejected Jesus at times in our own ways, in our own lives. So it's not a sacrifice, is not algebra, it's relational. Now, it is worth noting that the person who is committing the violence here and the act on, on Good Friday is, is, well, who is it? Right? Let's think about that for a minute. If you took the crucifixion, and let's say it's not a crucifixion, let's just for the sake of, of getting clear on it, let's say that it, Jesus wasn't crucified. Let's say he was shot. Right? He was shot. Who pulled the trigger? Think about that. If you, someone asked you, who pulled the trigger on Jesus? 
Sometimes we talk about the crucifixion and we talk about what's happening on the cross and how Jesus saves. Sometimes uh, the way I hear people talk about it, it sounds like there's this angry God. God the Father is so just hacked off at us. He is just going to take us out. And at the last second, he jerks his hand to the side and shoots his son instead. You ever hear the cross described quite like that? Like the wrath of God poured down. I've heard these sermons. I'm not really mocking them much. So this idea of like the wrath of God poured down upon Jesus, it makes God sound really angry. Right? Like God is the one pulling the trigger. And I don't think that's actually what's happening. What I read when I see, look for who's pulling the trigger, that the, the anger is in humanity. Right? Humanity pulls the trigger and God the Father weeps as his son dies. Right? Humanity pulls the trigger if there is a bullet to be shot. Right? Individually, as a group, as an entire community, God is not angry. We are. We're the ones who need to be at peace. Right? So Jesus responds to this shooting, to this crucifixion. <clears throat> and how does he respond? He responds with arms nailed wide. Right? That's how he responds. He responds, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. That's the moment when salvation happens. That's the moment when forgiveness begins. This is the moment when Jesus, having been put to death by the very worst of us, takes the position of humility and offers us forgiveness. Right? That's the sacrifice Jesus makes right there. Father, forgive them. That is when his wounds heal. That's when his bruises bring our salvation. That's when Jesus makes this sacrifice. What is it that Jesus sacrifices? When we say Jesus saves and Jesus sacrifices, what does Jesus sacrifice? If I come out here and just cold clock you across the head, what do you have every right to do back at me? Hit me right back, right? If I come out and wallop you, you have every right to wallop me back. So what did Jesus sacrifice? Humanity has crucified him, and he has sacrificed the right to get even. Right? That he has sacrificed the right to get even. Because how does this work? If I go out and wallop you, you wallop me back, what's going to happen? I'm going to hit you again. And call it a cycle of violence. Right? I hit you, you hit me, I hit you, you hit me. And is there ever going to be forgiveness or peace or salvation or normal or clean again? No. Someone has to say, Father, forgive them and sacrifice their right to get even. All right? The sacrifice Jesus makes on the cross that gets us back to this opportunity to be clean, to be normal, to have the peace that God desires for us, to rebuild shalom, right? The sacrifice of getting even, letting go of the right to get back at us. God has every right to hold our sin against us. And in this moment, we hear, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Right? Our sin punishes us enough, doesn't it? If I do something stupid, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to suffer for my stupid. No one needs to pile on. God does not need to punish me again for my stupid. I, I suffer enough for it. Right? Jesus sacrifices the right to get even. As Paul, he, Paul captures, this lang, capture, captures what's happened in this language when he talks about how uh, do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what we see here. Thus, what is happening on the cross is not mechanical, right? It's not a debt that I owe. We're not, Jesus is not on the cross paying a debt for me in that, again, it's not algebra. It's not like I can look at how much sin I've committed in my life and ask, like, is that sin, do I need, like, two pints of blood of Jesus for that sin? Or is that, like, a three-pint blood of Jesus? Is that, like, I need a liter of blood of Jesus to, to cure me of that, to heal me of that? Right? That sort of, it, that way of trying to understand it, that mechanical way, that algebraic way misses that this is all about relationship. This is seeing Jesus having his arms wide open, offering to forgive before we have sinned. Right? Before we have sinned, Jesus is already open to rebuilding a relationship that we desperately need. What's the more, most important relationship we have? The one with our Creator. The one who, who we have offended with our sin, and yet he responds, Father, forgive them. We are forgiven for, Je for Jesus' sacrifice, the right to get even, and he still holds his arms open today, continuing to do so. And so when we say Jesus saves, what we're doing is, informed by Leviticus, 
which forms a people to understand sacrifice as a relational way to get back to normal, to rebuild peace with God and neighbor. Formed by the suffering servant of Isaiah who helps see that how the sacrifice of, of a people or of a nation or of an, as an individual can be also sacrificial and good and healing, we can then understand that Jesus makes this sacrifice for us. He sacrifices the right to get even. He says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And he assumes a permanent stance of forgiveness. Father, forgive them. And it is in that forgiveness that we are saved. It is in that forgiveness that we are accepted. It's in that forgiveness that we can walk the path that Jesus has laid for us through this life, through death, and into the kingdom to come. It is this forgiveness that makes it possible for us to go out to be ambassadors of peace, to share with others, and share with others this good news that Jesus saves, and to let go of our right to get even with others as well. Jesus saves. Thanks be to God. Amen. Any questions? Covered a lot of ground pretty quick there. And we're all maybe a little bit groggy. I really wanted that extra hour of sleep. Does everyone, that make sense? Okay. Let us now...